Thank you for joining the Judaism Demystified podcast. Joseph Cohen, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got to where you are, what you do, and your hashkafa? Perfect. So I'm Joseph. I run an organization called the Israel Advocacy Movement. Uh, we are the largest online pro-Israel organization in the UK. We have we primarily create videos, and the videos get viewed by millions and millions of people. We've been shared by Donald Trump, Benjamin Netanyahu, when they were sitting heads of state. Um, and effectively, what we're interested in is the survival of the Jewish people. The One of the essential things I believe the Jews need to ensure that we do survive and that we have a future is a state for hundreds, thousands of years, well, 2,000 years, we've been dependent on the mercy of others to defend us when our enemies rise up to slaughter us. And for the first time in almost 2,000 years, we now have the ability to defend ourselves because we have a state, we have a place of refuge. And so for that reason, we advocate for Israel. I think what sets us apart from other organizations is the people that we're engaging with. We debate jihadis who fought for Daesh, fought in Syria. We debate the biggest neo-Nazis in the, the UK, in the world. And so we take our arguments to the enemies. I, my, I guess maybe if I start from my background, it'll make it a little easier for people to understand at least where I'm coming from. Sure. I was raised um, in a socialist household. I was raised with religion is the opiate of the masses. My father couldn't tell you the difference between a Hasidic Jew and a Reformed Jew. We were raised with absolutely nothing. And the only Jewish identity we had was one of anti-Semitism. There are people that want to kill us because of who we are. And that set me on a course of anti-fascism. I was very, very active on the left um, campaigning against um, neo-Nazis in the UK um, throughout my early 20s. And when I decided I wanted to become um, more observant, it was a, quite a long journey, but I decided I wanted to, to take on um, the, the traditions of my, my ancestors rather than my father, <laughs> which would have been communism. Um, I moved to London. That put me in touch with not just Orthodox Jews, but um, actually I'll get there, I'm getting ahead of myself. So when I joined the community and when I became more observant, I moved to um, the, I guess, the hub of Judaism within Northwest London and became more religious. And one of the things that surprised me was I encountered um, hostility towards Muslims. And so coming from, from a small members, a small number of members of the community and that got me questioning, okay, is there anything I can do here to um, improve relations between Jews and Muslims um, amongst Orthodox Jews? And I launched an organization back then called JudaismIslam.com, which looked to promote the commonalities between Judaism and Islam, hoping that if we were aware of how similar our religions are, that familiarity would breed tolerance of each other. Um, that put me in contact with the Muslim community, and I realized that the problem was even worse on that side in terms of the hostility towards the Jewish people. And the, the site was relatively successful. It was getting a million visitors a year. Um, we, uh, the majority of whom were, were Muslim, and there's some interesting stories. As an example, I got a message one day from a chap, I'll just go with one of his names, Haroon, um, who'd messaged me on Facebook. He'd reached out to the organization and said, look, I'm in a bit of a crisis. I, I found out I'm of Jewish descent. And so I looked at his profile and it's got the big um, black standard, which is the flag that Islamists carry into battle. It's a, it's a flag, it's the black flag with the right whiting on, similar to the, 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 the Daesh, the ISIS flag. Yeah. But um it's it's just got the shahada on it which is the the islamic declaration of faith 
And so it's a pretty devout Muslim. He's got the black standard as his Facebook, and he's asking me about Judaism. And so I, his question was, look, I think I'm Jewish. My grandma's Jewish on my mum's side. And I was like, okay, you're, you're probably Jewish. Um, and he said, look, can I practice Judaism and Islam at the same time? And so I pointed out, and there may be some theological problems, but ignoring the philosophical issues, like who is a prophet, who isn't a prophet, what happens if, which it will, Shabbat falls on Ramadan, where you're commanded to eat meals, drink wine, etc., and you're also commanded to fast? Um, there are other verses in the Quran, like it says in the Quran, all of the sea from the all of the food from the sea is lawful unto you. Wait a minute, as a Jew, not everything in the sea is lawful unto you. It's very hard to practice these two faiths, and so I put them in touch with some people and advise them that yeah i don't think you can practice both faiths but here are some um some rabbis who may be able to give you some some better guidance than i would as i am very much a layman and i stopped i didn't think about them again um and then a year and a half ago i was giving a talk at a jewish organization a kirov organization oh, reminded me of Harun, of Harun. so i went back to his profile and his name was no longer Harun. It was Aharon, which is the wow. Hebrew name for Harun. Aaron, Harun <laughs> is the same name. And gone was the black standard, the ice and um, the, the jihadi battle flag. And it had been replaced with a picture of the Kotel, <laughs> the wow. Israeli flag. And so we've got many, many, many stories of both Jews and Muslims engage, interacting with this website and coming to a more peaceful path. Um, but during this time, I obviously became more and more aware of anti-Semitism within the, the wider Muslim community and within the UK in general. So I then launched a second organization, which was called the Campaign Against Anti-Semitism. That organization still exists today and has reached heights that I could have never taken it to. Um, it's run by an amazing um, team, um, Gideon Falter and all his um, colleagues do a tremendous job fighting anti-Semitism in the UK. Um, and the Gaza war broke out. So this was in 2014. And there was anti-Semitism everywhere. Over Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, wherever you look, there was anti-Semitism on the streets. Hamas, Hamas, Jews to the gas. Hitler was right. Just the worst anti-Semitism. And then this war stopped and all of the anti-Semitism disappeared. But what persisted was, I don't hate Jews. I just hate Zionists. Right. I'm not against Judaism. I'm just against Israel. And I realized that Israel or Zionism was the acceptable face of anti-Semitism for our generation. In other generations, it's been it, anti-Semitism tends to scapegoat the Jews and it becomes acceptable in different forms. So under um Christianity, we were called um deicides, we 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 killed God. Under Islam, in terms of Jesus, under uh, Islam, we were the killers of prophets. Under uh, communism, we were the capitalists. And and the international bourgeoisie, um, the cosmopolitan bourgeoisie. Under uh, Nazism, we were the Bolsheviks and the capitalists. And whatever the ills of a society are, the the Jews are always scapegoated. Today, it's human rights. Um, human rights is the, the worst offender you can do. So, of course, they say Jews are the worst um, human rights violators in the world, despite the inverse being the reality. And so I recognize that Zionism was the acceptable face of anti-Semitism. And I decided to launch the Israel Advocacy Movement. Um, and we've grown into the, the largest organization in the UK doing what we do. Videos get viewed by millions and millions of people. And we've had tremendous success uh, reaching other communities, other communities that other organizations just can't reach. Our YouTube, we get millions of views every month, and it's majority Muslim views and majority Christian views. It's like Jews are a smaller audience for us on, on YouTube. So we're really punching out of the echo chamber. And then the final question, Hashkafa. So <laughs> the easiest way to describe this is I know that you've had um, rabbis on your podcast that I consider either real life teachers of mine or online teachers of mine, whether it's um, Mordecai Ishemani, whether it is Rabbi Dweck, 
Um, for all all of these people are um are people I look up to, I admire, I learn from. I try to the best of my ability to follow the Mishnah Torah. Um, my family lost their traditions. They didn't know. Well, we know where we're from in Poland, but were we chusses? Were we, we no idea? And so I kind of a blank, a blank canvas, so to speak. And for me, it was about finding authenticity. And I, I believe the Mishnah Torah is the 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 greatest. And I'm very much a layman, and there are people who are far more knowledgeable <laughs> on these subjects than I am that you've actually had on your podcast. But for me, in terms of preserving the Talmudic conclusion mm-hmm. and having an authentic Masora all the way back to the uh, academies of Bavel, um, I see the Mishnah Torah as that text, and therefore I, to my best of my ability, try to 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 follow um, the Mishnah Torah. Sitting in the UK, that can be a little isolating because we don't have any um, Temani or Rambam jewels, but we we um, we do have there. There, there is certainly um, people who hold similar. And I say in the UK. Um, you have obviously the Chabura, which do incredible work, as I'm sure you're aware of many of the. Of course. The, yeah. Yeah. And and so there's, I, definitely, I the, uh, there's definitely like a revival of uh, Maimonidean uh, uh, Hashkafa. So I think that, you know, even though it seems like we're isolated, we're not as isolated as we think. So it's it's nice to see. So I, I actually want to ask you because you touched on the fact that. You have these videos that have millions of views. I've seen the videos, um, and we see you arguing in the park, let's say, with uh, uh, you know these like Muhammad Hijab and Ali Dawa, and you know um, very kind of uh, um, kind of aggressive um, protesters. I don't I don't know if I can call them protesters or debaters. And I always wondered, like, do these actually does this accomplish anything? Because are you gaining respect from them or do they see, does it actually reinforce their hatred? The, like, what is the end goal? And do you find that, you know, you're getting somewhere with this? So my primary audience used to be the enemies of Israel, the enemies of the Jewish people. My audience today, or my target audience today, despite punching out of the echo chamber, is very much Jews. And I say that because most Jews live in a bubble and we're not aware of what, how we're viewed outside of that bubble. And so I think it's re- one of the most important things that my organization does is shine a spotlight on the types of anti-Semitism we face from different communities within the UK and making Jews aware of the threat, um, I, I think is a a tremendous responsibility because if we're unaware of that threat it poses a a much more real danger to us than if we are aware of the the type of hostility we face the second audience are those that are neutral on the subject irrespective of which community they belong to whether it's um, just your average english white um christian atheist it doesn't really matter or whether it's a, a Muslim that is just your, your average Muslim, um, no hostility to anyone, um, no strong feelings about um, the Jews. Most Muslims do have a strong feeling on Israel, but certainly um, the Jewish people. They're my secondary target. And there we have tremendous success. I'm going to just, I'll give you an example. I don't know, this is literally, I, actually I won't. I'll explain it. There's a, a video I have on, on our YouTube, and I encourage all your viewers to go and subscribe. Um, but before you subscribe, check out a video which is called Jew Refuses to Convert to Islam. I've lost you. No, okay, there you are. Okay. So tell me if you can hear this. Israel, what condition? Yeah. What's the condition? Yeah, yeah. And all is yours, but you pray Allah. You pray. So I already prayed to Allah. So I to Allah. So your your prophet, yeah. when my people had a dispute, they would go to Muhammad and he would judge from my book for them. Don't tell me I don't pray to Allah because your prophet would not go to, to my book if we're not praying to Allah. So take those words from your mouth. So what you're saying now, you're I'm saying I'm saying La ilaha illallah. 
محمد رسول الله موسى رسول الله Muhammad was fine with my people practicing my faith to the very fact you had someone like Rabbi Mukhair, who who's one of his best friends, and he fought in the Battle of Uhud, and he founded a Jew, a rabbi, founded the first Islamic wah to take those words out of your mouth that I have to apostate from my faith. Do we keep you? Is let me just I'm just gonna um two seconds. Just realized that's the wrong account. I just uh, <laughs> let me put this other account on. Um, I'm just going to share again. There you go. Let me reshare. And, um, so now I'm just going to pull up the comments. Mm -hmm. um, can you see my comments? Yes. Let me zoom in on these. Oops. Let me do that again. I saw the wicked you is I saw the wicked you Israel. There we go. No condition. Yeah. What's the condition? Let's pause that. Sorry, let me just try and do I uh, saw the wicked you Israel. No yeah. condition. Yeah. What's the condition? There. This is what I want to show you. So this is the most important part of what to take away from this. So this video is probably being viewed. A couple of hundred thousand times. I haven't I can't remember. Well, I'll check in a minute. Um as a Muslim, I must accept that you responded well. As a Muslim, I can claim that this dude had more Islamic knowledge than 95% of the Muslims around. As a Muslim, please don't force people to become Muslim. Hidiya make uh, comes from Allah. We as humans just give dawa. You know, as a Muslim, this new man was on point and knew our history very well. He's a righteous Jew. May Allah accept him as a righteous Muslim. As, as a Muslim, I must admit he responded well. As a Muslim myself, appreciates the knowledge that you possess and wish Allah will provide you with more enlightenment. I, I can go on and on. You get the idea. No, this no, is just no. like compliment after compliment after compliment. And the, the reason I'm showing those comments is to show that depending how I interact with the audience uh, or the, the, the person I'm debating will determine how the audience reacts to me. If I show you another video where I'm pointing out an anti-Semitic aspect of Islamic history, the comments will all be death to the Yahud, death to Yahudi. And, it's, and it can be the same person. It's one of the beautiful things of YouTube. You can see which other comments these people have left me. And how the algorithm works is if I get a video that goes viral and... A million Muslims watch it. It's highly likely those Muslims will be served other videos of mine. And they often don't realize they're commenting on the same person. And so in one video, video they'll be wishing me like the, the highest rewards in Jannah, the highest levels of Jannah. <laughs> and in the next video, they're like, death to the Jew. This Jew is the... And so one of the things I, I recognize is the power to reach other communities and the responsibility of that. I'll actually take it to an even better example than that. So we were talking about Muhammad Hijab before. Now, I'm going to show you a, let me just make that big. I'm going to show you another, this is just a, a debate I had. So the, the chap you're looking at here, is you could yeah, hopefully you can only see the the you hopefully you can see the screen, um, which is a chap called Abdul Hakim. Hakim's an interesting name because Hakim is Hakam. It's right. not it's, it's why the wise I'm one. Actually, I'm actually learning Sefer Daniel right now uh, okay. with one of my rabbis, and uh, we're we're talking about the Hakim or the the it's like the Hakam, but we have in our community the Hakimians, you know, the Persians. So it's yeah. it comes from the same root, yeah. Amazing. And so Abdul Hakim um, is interesting because uh, he, it's interesting that wisdom and knowledge is his name because he's not, he's not the sharpest tool in the box. But that, that aside, um, he is one of the most notorious jihadis in the UK. Um, I don't know if you ever heard of the Sharia patrols, no. but they were a... Basically, if a woman walked through a one of these Muslim neighborhoods immodestly dressed, they would chase her out. If an Englishman walked through drinking beer, they would chase him out, saying this is a Muslim-only neighborhood. It was um, it was it was a big big story in the UK around ten years ago. The Sharia patrols. Okay. He was he was jailed for organizing the Sharia patrols. Um, I don't know if you remember the London Bridge terror cell. Um, was a terrorist attack on London yeah. Bridge. And Corin Butts was in a documentary with this guy called the Jihadis Next Door. Um, 
He's this man has been in and out of jail for extremism. I'm told he's in jail today now, and I don't know if that's true or not, but he's in jail today for extremism. Now, I've debated Abdul Hakim many times, and I think it's safe to say if someone is a so he's a Talmud of Anjim Chowdhury, Anjim Chowdhury is responsible for a large percentage of the extremists, the terrorists in the UK today. His organization, um is directly linked to numerous people that have carried out atrocities. Anjum Chowdhury himself was jailed for supporting, I, I don't want to get this wrong because of the legal ramifications, but something in relation, he was jailed in relation to, to, to ISIS. Now, I can't remember the exact reason he was jailed, but this guy's a major extremist in the UK, and this guy we're looking at on the screen is a student of his. Um, now, I debated him. And debated him and debated him several times. And it's always relatively civil when we clash. And I was clicking on one of the debates I had with Mohammed Hijab. And I noticed that Abdul Hakim had left a comment under that video. And that comment went like this. Joseph has more al wala wal bara than the Muslims. I never thought I'd say this. But I really respect Joseph's honesty. How can we expect and wish him to give a different answer? He loves his people, and so he should. And well, what I gain from that is it doesn't matter whether you're speaking to somebody who is neutral on Israel or the Jewish people. It doesn't matter whether you're speaking to someone who is radicalized and presumably very hostile towards the Jewish people. If you come to that conversation from an unapologetic place of pride, where you are not caveating your Judaism, where you are not caveating your support of Israel, one of the worst things I encounter with people who say they support the state of Israel is they will enter into a conversation with a Muslim or a anti-Zionist or a Christian, it doesn't really matter, and they will always open with, I support Israel, but, and then comes, but I don't support the, the current government, but I don't support the settlements, but I don't support the state. Uh, so it really doesn't matter. There's always that, but, and if you come to it, if you come to that same conversation and instead of, but it's just, I support Israel. I'm an Orthodox Jew. I don't like the term Orthodox, but an observant Jew. And I follow in the traditions of my ancestors to the best of my abilities. And I'm not ashamed of that. I'm not apologizing for things that it says in the text. Maybe there's something I disagree with, but that is what Judaism is. And I follow it to the best of my ability. If you come to that conversation from a place of pride and confidence, you will inst you, you will gain and earn the respect of the person you're speaking with. So I don't know what Abdul Hakim, what his views would have been towards Jews, what he may, how hostile he was to them, how hostile he could be today, and how positive an impact I've had on him. But I would hope through our interactions, Abdul Hakim and any of the people watching the debates that we have will come away with a more respectful and real view of who we are rather than who they think we are. Yeah, and I actually, um, I was telling you off camera, but my interactions with Muslims mostly have been positive, and uh, they, they, always, I always believe that you know Muslims, uh, Muslims respect Jews who respect Judaism. When they see that we are committed and not apologizing for things and not being wishy washy, they see they they're actually interested to know, like, oh wow, you guys do this, we we also do something similar. And I feel like it's so un it's so unfortunate that there's like, you know, centuries of of kind of distrust um, because there is a lot of commonality, there is a lot of common ground we could find, and essentially we're worshiping, you know, Hashem, Allah. So um, my my hope is that you know there is a a uh, understanding that comes out of this, and you know, I recently had Imam Abdullah Antepli on. Um, the podcast and he's just also a great friend of the Jews and Israel and he's part of that process of bridging that gap between our communities so I think what you're doing even if it's a very different approach 
Um, I believe that, you know, you're, you're, you're risking your life and, you know, I commend you for that, but I think this is really, you know, a step in, in a great direction. And I actually don't think what we're doing is dissimilar. I think we're doing the same thing. And the reason I say that is if anyone has got involved in interfaith, what you'll find is it's really just a photo opportunity for leaders of different communities to pose with each other and tell each other how similar our religions are. Isn't it a shame that we don't have peace? But if you ever attend any interfaith event, what you're absolutely forbidden from mentioning is Israel. Now, that's quite problematic <laughs> if you're a Jew, given how central Israel as a modern state, but also historically how central Israel is to, to our religion, to our existence, to our daily life. If we can't talk about one of the biggest aspects of every single Jew's life, how can we have a real conversation? So what you're doing, what the, the imam's doing, what I'm doing is all the same thing. What we're doing is we're creating real relationships based on reality rather than some fictitious fantasy where we can all get along as long as we don't mention the thing which is actually driving us apart. Yeah, yeah and I actually wanted to get into uh, Zionism. My friend, uh, Yosef Elia, just going to give him a shout out because he sent me a bunch of questions. He's a big fan of yours. I'm and the question, is, the question is, what is Zionism? You know, it means different things to different people. Why does it get a bad rap, especially like on campuses and in the media these days? Like, what do you think is the cause of this meteoric rise of anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism? So the simplest answer is today, Zionism is simply the support for the existence of Israel as a Jewish state. Historically, it had slightly different definitions. But today, now that the state of Israel has come into existence, to be a Zionist, all one needs to do is support the right of Israel to, to exist as it is today, as a Jewish state. That's not at the exclusion of anybody else. You could be for a two-state solution and still be a Zionist. So every Palestinian that advocates for a two-state solution um, is, by definition, a Zionist. If the other state in that two-state solution is the nation-state of the Jewish people, if it is Israel. And so that is in its most simple definition. Now, how are, how are the people, what are the people envision when they hear the word Zionism is very different and it differs from, from community to community. So if you are on the left, particularly the far left, and you hear the word Zionism, you think colonialism. Colonialism is the greatest evil, but one of the great evils for the, for the left. And so obviously, the Jews are scapegoat as the ultimate colonial power. Now, the irony of that is, is Israel is not a colonial project. If, if anything, it's an indigenous rights movement. It's um, So when the British went and colonized the Americas, um, they created New York. They named New, New England. They named the places after the old world because they were call it they were they were coming from the metropole to the new place colonizing it importing an a, a, a foreign culture onto a new land israel it's the opposite when the jews came they were resurrect or not resurrecting they were just preserving the ancient names of these places the jewish names of these places and the the, the inverse is true so the Arab names actually have roots usually to the Jewish names. Almost all the Arab towns and villages reference Jewish. So Ramallah is a great example. Ramallah, it's like it's the de facto capital city for the Palestinians. Um, it's where all the, the PA, the Palestinian Authority National Institutions are based. And Ramallah used to be called Ram Allah. And so there was a, I think, a 16th century Dutchman went to all the Christian villages and he recorded, uh, sorry, all the, the villages in, in Israel. And he recorded that there was a village called Ram Allah 
And there was like 16 Christian families living there. So it used to be a Christian village. And he says it was right next to the ancient city of Bet El. So what had happened was Bet El had become Bet Allah, the house of God. And then from there it became Ram Allah. And then from Ram Allah, it became Ram Allah. And so if you look at the, the, the Arabic names, they actually clearly document that Israel is not a colonizing force. It's not external culture being imported into a foreign land. It's the, the resurrection of the indigenous culture, the indigenous people on that land. So the left, when they hear the word um, Zionism, they think colonialist. They think the greatest evils they can imagine. When Muslims hear the word Zionist, it's like I've had so much experience of this. It basically means Jews I dislike in most my, and this is anecdotal, but I will have people tell me that um, the, the Quran talks about the, the Zionists and how you, you can't um, you can't take the Zionists as your friends. There's, the word Zionist doesn't occur <laughs> anywhere in the Quran. Obviously, it's a much more modern term. And when the Quran's talking about this, it's not talking about Zionists, it's talking about Jews. Now we can say it's some Jews that were back there that was contextualized at that time. Or we could, you could say it's all Jews, but irrespective, it's talking about Jews and not Zionists. Um, but Zionism, as in my experience, my anecdotal experience amongst most of the Muslims I interact with in the UK, is basically a code for Jews that I dislike. Um, those that are more familiar with the politics will just extend it to people I dislike. And so Zionists then takes on, it's not just Jews, but there's Christian Zionists, there's Jewish Zionists, but they're basically the people that are trying to control the world. It's the new world order. It's whatever conspiracy theory they project under the world word. But it rarely means what it actually means, which is just a person who supports the right for Israel to exist as a Jewish state. And actually, um, you know, one of the attacks that I see on Jews is that they they say that we are not Jewish and, you know, the land of Israel was called Palestine before. But can you explain to our audience who isn't aware why Israel was named Palestine? Um, so, and, yeah. And, and also, what are the archaeologists finding um, when they do digs? So this is one of the greatest misconceptions um, or sleights of hand that plagues the, the the discourse and there's an assumption that because there are a group of people today that identify as palestinian that group has always existed since time immemorial um the the palestim the the philistines were the traditional enemies of the jewish people they were an aegean people who established thousands of years ago a Pentopolis, a five-city state in the south of Israel, near Ashkelon, Ashdod, Gaza City, that sort of area. They had a small state. So it was Europeans who had a small, Mediterranean Europeans who had a small state or a small um, five-city state in the south of Israel. Um, it was well documented that these were the traditional enemies of the, the Jewish people. We had many wars with them. And when the Jews rebelled against Rome and Rome ultimately crushed the Jewish rebellion, um, they renamed the entire region from Judea to Syria, Palestina. And the region stretched, stretched from the from Egypt, um, or like in the Sinai, all the way up to Turkey, Syria. So it was a huge, huge province. Um, now, there was a 2000 period a 2000 year period in between then and the emergence of the Palestinians as a people. Now, well, I believe name, I just want to understand that the name was given by the Romans in order to kind of insult the Jews. Sorry, yes, I, I, absolutely. It was, they renamed it the, the Syria Palestine. Absolutely. The ultimate insult you could do to the Jewish people who'd rebelled was to rename the area after their traditional enemy, the, the, the Philistines. Now, I believe in like you if we are to win the the information war we have to be honest and there are definitely that the name Palestine was preserved primarily by Europeans but there are instances um numerous instances of Muslims referring to the the land of Philistine but it was 
in relation to it being renamed by the Romans. The, the you, however, the region when it was under Islam was most typically referred to as Balad al Sham, um, uh, southern Syria. And in fact, when you if you fast forward to 1936, there's a very famous um, uh, part of the Zionist history was the Peel Commission where they were invested, the, the European powers, British, were investigating what we're going to do with the land. They interviewed lots of people, and they inv in, in, interviewed one of the Arab leaders, Oni Bey Abd al-Hadi, who is on record, anyone can read, read the Pale Report, telling the, the British at the time that Palestine is, has never existed. Palestine is a word the Zionists created. Um, so... They saw themselves, they said, we've always seen this as Syria and this is southern Syria. So back then, if you look at all the, so in the 20s, 30s, there was definitely a region called British Mandatory Palestine. When the British took mandate over it, they resurrected the European name, which was Palestine. They're not going to call it Israel. They're not going to call it anything. Yeah, they resurrected the old European name, which is how Europeans had always referred to the region since the Roman times. Um, they referred to it as mandatory British mandatory Palestine. And if you actually look at the other people who are using that name, it was almost entirely Jews. So I carry coins in my pocket from British mandatory Palestine. They have the the the, the word Eretz Israel written across them in Hebrew, um, usually with a, a Yud Aleph. Um, sorry, Aleph Yud. And they... If you look at like the football team, Jewish, if you look at all the organ the companies that exist there, like one that persists in the UK, most UK families will on occasion drink a bottle of wine called Palwin. Palwin stands for the Palestine Wine Company. Um the there was the Palestine Line, which was a ferry from New York to to Israel, the 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 Palestine Palestinian Electric Company, the Palestinian Airway, all of these companies that were called Palestine were all Jewish. Um and so in the 60s, having realized that Pan-Arabism had largely failed, and in reaction to the successes of the Zionist project and the successes of the State of Israel, the Arabs in, in the region adopted the national identity of Palestinian. And so they became the Palestinians, but they have no connection to the, the majority of the, uh, they have no connection to the, the, the ancient Philistines, and instead, they are more connected to Arabs that came to the land in later periods, either with the, the conquest from Omar and various other Khalafa caliphates that conquered the land, or which were from the 7th century onward, or more recently, between 1882 and 1946, there was a huge population explosion. Um, the region witnessed the largest population explosion of anywhere in the Middle East. Um, and that's because Arabs were attracted en masse to the land and Jews were attracted en masse to the land. Zionists built up, the British built up the infrastructure, they created economic opportunities that didn't exist anywhere else in the Middle East, and that attracted a huge wave of Arab migration. And so the Monday Palestinians in the 60s um, really took on that identity. It's not for me to say that Palestinians don't exist today. I'm not going to tell someone that they don't have the right to identify however they they wish that would be I'm, hypocritical of us yes because we're denying them of their identity and we're asking people not to do that to us uh but but what you're stating is that is about you know for example um there were always jews living in the land of israel throughout it, they kind of make it seem as if like these jews came in last century and then they were never there to begin with and the fact is like every single archaeological dig is just proving more and more that the people who speak the same language today, you know, the Jews who speak the same language, read, write, um, all the biblical figures, everything is coming to light. Every archaeological dig is proving that we were always there. And I actually recently got, I'm, I'm a peacenik, you know, I'm, I don't like, uh, you know, I, I want to see uh, an end to all this conflict um, without violence, you know, but I I got attacked on social media um, by someone, by, by a Muslim who was, you know, saying that, you know, there were no Jews um, in 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 the ancient times. It's, it's all made up. So I said, can you name a Palestinian from, you know, 2000 years ago during the Roman Empire, the famous Palestinian who wasn't Jewish? And then it turned into like just like, you know, nasty comments. And then, you know, whatever. He stopped talking to me. But really, because I'm just being honest, like 
where are they? Jesus was a Jew, right? All, all those people who lived there were Jews. It's even more than that. So I think one of the biggest misconceptions that plagues the historical view, even for those that are aware of the history, they believe that 2,000 years ago, the Jews were exiled from the land. And it's simply not true. Like anyone who's studied Gemara, anyone who's studied like uh, the Shulchan Aruch, it doesn't matter what you, that the rabbis that penned our greatest um, works in the last 2,000 years, almost all of the, the major, major, major authorities either lived in or visited the land. Actually, just before the Islamic conquest, most people aren't aware of this, just before the Islamic conquest, it's, I think most people put the date of Omar, who was the the second caliph of Islam. So you basically had Muhammad, Abu Bakr, and then um, Omar. He's considered one of the four rightly guided caliphs under in Is Islamic thought. Um, he conquered Jerusalem in 637. Around 70 years prior to that, Obviously, the the land were the the dominant power in the region then was Christianity, the the Byzantines. Um, the Jews established a small vassal state that was subordinate to Persia. They helped the Persians come in and conquer the land, and in return, the Persians gave the the Jews a small state. There was like it's estimated between two to four hundred thousand Jews living in the the north of Israel at this point in history. And it just doesn't marry up to this image that most people have that for thousands of years, the, the land was barren of any Jews. And then in 1948 or 1917, suddenly overnight, the land was just flooded with Jewish immigrants. It's simply not true. Um, the Bet Yosef, Rambam, um, Ramban, like, <laughs> from Rabbi Akiva all the way to, yeah. the, it, there were so many Jewish rabbis, Jewish people, Jewish communities flourishing in the land. Yeah, and I I also see like Muslims defending Israel, and maybe they're 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 taking a big risk by doing that. But they're saying that like the Jews have the, are it's rightfully their land because even the Quran and Muhammad and every, they 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 say this is the land of the Jews, right? It's promised to the Jews. So, so a lot of people just don't know that. So I used to do a lot of I used to engage with Muslims with those talking points, and I decided that for me. That's not appropriate. If a Muslim is saying that, then absolutely, I will celebrate that. I will shine a spotlight on any Muslim that wants to give a religious justification for the state of Israel, the modern state of Israel. I count many Muslims, my dear friends, who publicize such messages. However, I don't follow the Quran. I don't follow the Hadith. It's not really my place to go to a Muslim and tell them this is what your book says. And so I personally refrain from doing that because they also they tend to have very good reasons um, for why they don't think that's the case. The most common one is that they will say that we turned our back on Allah, which is in the, in the verses where it says that um, Israel was promised to the Jews. It then says, unless you turn your back uh, and then you'll lose it. Um, I'm paraphrasing, but for me, at the very least, I don't I don't tell Christians what they should believe. I don't tell Muslims what they should believe. However, what I would say is I sincerely believe that Muslims and Jews in the near future will have a very different existence than we do today. If you'd have told a Jew 500 years ago that our closest supporters, our closest friends in the world are going to be devoutly religious Christians, our ancestors would have looked at us like we were insane. Yet here we are today, and one of the biggest supporters of the modern state of Israel and the Jewish people are evangelical Christians in America or around the world. I see it. I think we we are those Jews from 500 years ago today. And when we're told that Jews and Muslims will, could have a future where Muslims are going to be amongst our closest friends, today that's incomprehensible for most of us. But I sincerely believe that those seeds of change have already been planted. The, the, the winds have turned and we're experiencing more and more Muslims in the state, either through the Abraham Accords or just general just ordinary Muslims on the street who are becoming more and more open to the, the religious support of a Jewish state in that region, which doesn't threaten Islam and is actually 
brings two communities together that ideally should be together. We shouldn't be divided. We pray to the same God. We we have very, very similar um, religious practices, and there have been very positive times throughout our history. Unfortunately, there have been negative times as well, but there have been positive times where we've coexisted and flourished alongside each other, and I see it tomorrow where that could be the case for, for Israel. Uh -huh. We, we, I mean, the Abraham Accords is a great example. If you see what's happening in the UAE and now soon to be the rumored peace treaty between Israel and Saudi Arabia to become official, that's going to, you know, make waves. Um, I think that people are just tired of, I think also in the, in the Muslim world, like their natural resources, oil. And, you know, because of that reliance, you know, maybe they didn't develop uh, technology the way they should have and now I think they're starting to realize we have to invest in our future when this eventually runs out. And, you know, the Jews are, we're, they only fight with us when we fight with them. So yeah. let's, let's, let's try to talk to them and become their friends. And I think it's going, you know, it seems to be going very well. It seems to be something that has a lot of potential to grow. Um, and, you know, I want to just kind of dispel certain notions. Um, number one about apartheid and is the claim that Israel is, in a, is apartheid. Because, um, you know, I was watching a very famous video by Hillel Neuer of UN Watch, who I'd love to have on my show. Uh, but he he has a famous video where he went to the UN and he was telling them, you know, you're claiming Israel's an apartheid state. And then he says, Algeria, you had X amount of Jews, a few hundred thousand or whatever it is in, in this year. Where are your Jews? You know, Egypt, where are your Jews? Syria, where are your Jews? And it seems as if the... The apartheid was happening to Jews in all of these nations that event that kicked us out. Um, so, I want to know from your perspective, what do you, how do you respond to people who claim that Israel is an apartheid state? It is so easy. So, what we're dealing with is classic projection. So, there are over two million Arabs, or just around two million Arabs that live in Israel. They have complete equality with Jews. They are represented in government. They are represented in the judiciary system. In fact, there are Arab judges that have sent a Jewish prime minister and a Jewish president to jail. Um, the highest performing religious group in education isn't religious Jews. It's religious Arab Christians. And so we have a reality where we're told that Israel is an apartheid state. Yet we can look at the laws, we can look at the status of Arabs, be they Christian or Muslim, and say that there is complete equality. They are protected equal citizens under the law. Then if you look to the east um, and you look to the Palestinian Authority, then we actually do see apartheid. So if an Arab has the chutzpah, the audacity to sell their house to a Jew, they face death or jail if a jew wants to be a citizen of a future palestinian state there is an article 6 of their national charter states that any jew that what came after the zionist conquest which most interpret as being 1917 um they have no right to palestinian citizenship so all of the Jews in that region, pretty much all of the Jews today, would not qualify for Palestinian states, which is why there isn't one. I mean, I'm told there is one. When I've said this before, but there are basically no Palestinian Jews. Yet there are two million Israeli Arabs, and they want to call Israel the apartheid. There are hundreds of mosques throughout Israel, hundreds of churches throughout Israel, not one synagogue in any of the territory that the Palestinian Authority control. If there is any apartheid in the region, it is a Palestinian apartheid against Jews. But no one on the left will say that. You'll never hear that discussed at the United Nations. You'll never hear that discussed anywhere because they're too busy demonizing Jews who've created one a beacon of democracy and equality in the region. Well, they talk about ethnic cleansing and genocide, but, you know, the Palestinian population is growing and growing and growing. So I, I don't understand that kind of like, really, if you're going to make a bold faced lie, you know, that that's one that really has to be backed up. And that's not very well established. Um, I definitely think that 
there are things Israel has to do to improve. Uh, we have, uh, you know, we're still, there are still, um, there's still a major part of the conflict that you have to say Israel has to take some responsibility for. Um, but at the same time, I feel like they need, we need to actually, maybe from a grassroots perspective, we need to actually have conversations with them and try to understand each other. Something that like Rudy, Rashman, people like that, who I think are doing a great job. I know they have a lot of critics, but like I, f I trust the people on the ground more than I trust governments in terms of getting the conversation going. And uh, what, do you, what are your thoughts about that? So I think ultimately the change needs to come from those who have real influence I'm engaging on the the, the grassroots, Rudy. All the yeah, there's many many um, peace activists that engage in the ground and they do phenomenal work, but ultimately, the change needs to come from those who wield influence. And I think for the Palestinians, the greatest influence actually doesn't come from the the street. It doesn't come from the be that the the the. Palestinian street or the the Arab street in general, it comes from those that wield authority within the the wider Muslim and Arab world, and that's exactly where the Abraham Accords really um, show us the path forward. When you have state after state making peace with Israel, it creates a reality where the Palestinian leadership can bear. Can begin to follow, um, so I I hope that as Israel makes more peace treaties with more of the states that surround it, it's realised that Israel is not a threat to any of its neighbours, that the Palestinians will exist in a reality where their leaders no longer fear making peace, um, and can agree. To the tank, kind of the, the the offers that have been historically made and could be made in the future. If you look at two thousand and eight, when Omar offered basically everything, he offered the Palestinians all of the land that they wanted. Where Israel were to retain some of the the settlements, like the Etzion block, Gush Etzion, like uh, that there, there would be trades for land, and the Arabs would get more fertile, better land, more land, and um, than the Jews would gain. So the Arabs would come out with more land. He proposed dividing Jerusalem into east and west. He offered them the 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 holy city, the old city, and the holy basin. Um, that would all become under the custodianship of Israel, the Palestinians, Jordan, the Saudis, and America. And that all of this was offered, and the Palestinians walked away. And they walk away every single time because there isn't the support internally from the Palestinian people, but there also isn't support from the wider Muslim world. And I think changing the Muslim world is much, much easier because they have, it's easier for a state to, to make peace with Israel if it's, let's say, a Gulf state where there's it's mutually beneficial, there are common threats like the, the Iranians, and it's just much easier to make those peace. And then hopefully it creates the opportunity for the Palestinians to follow. Um, so I don't know how much time you have, but um, I have two more questions that I really want to ask you. Um, one of them is it's related to what we we're talking about, but from the Jewish side, because regarding some of the Haredi Jews who believe that we should not have the land back unless God or a prophet gives it to us or a temple will descend from the heavens. And, uh, you know, they have this idea of the three oaths. I've talked about it on my podcast as well. Um, how would you respond to that claim as a religious Zionist that, you know, the the land of Israel is kind of like not really meant for us now. And it was actually taken by kind of us secular usurpers. So it, for me, again, I am not I, I'm not going to profess to know that there are incredible rabbis with far more knowledge than me that do hold by the three oaths. But I have to be sincere and genuine and uh, truthful with myself. And when you read, so first and foremost, in Judaism, we have to separate Agadita from Halacha. And Halacha is everything. And so first and foremost, the only prophetic law that we follow is the prophetic law of Moshe, of Moses. So we don't take law 
from Batal. We don't take law. We take law from Moses. And then the additional law that we follow is the the Talmudic conclusion, the Takanot, the Gezerot, the, the laws that were enacted by the, the Bet Din Hagadol, the Great Court, the Supreme Court, the Sanhedrin, um, as they are preserved in the Talmud. Now, there's always going to be dif- disagreement um, 1,500 years after the sealing of the Talmud. Um, there's going to be disagreement as to what that conclusion may be, which is why I think it's important to to identify the, the the where the authority lies, and for me, the 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 clearest recording of the Talmudic conclusion, which strips out all of the the minhagim that may have evolved after the 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 the, the, uh, the kalot of Ravashi and Ravina, um, is the Mishnah Torah. And so, if you look to the Mishnah Torah, which Maimonides wrote so the entire oral law could be in the mouth of a simpleton like myself unfortunately it's not all in my mouth yet but Bezrat Hashem, uh, one day it will be um we don't find any mention of the three oaths we find law after law in relation to the land of israel saying things like that if it's more preferable to live in a non-jewish city in israel than it is to live in a Jewish city outside of Israel. He gives three conditions as to where, if you're living in the land, when you can leave the land. So I think it's to get married, to study Torah, I think, or if your possessions, I haven't learned this in a while, um, but or if your possessions are threatened, then you can go to, to retrieve them. But then you should come back. You should come back to it's Israel. Um, and so then if you go further, if you so okay, it's not in the Mishnah Torah anywhere. Um what about other codifications? Well, the Rambans gloss on the on Rambam's mitzvot when it comes to the fourth commandment. He says actually, in every generation, there's an obligation to take possession of the land. And this is so. This is Ramban. He's saying we should get. And so wherever you look in the law, um, in the the major codification, it's not in the Shulchan Aruch. It's not in. It, it, it's absent. Um, in terms of the three oaths being halacha. And similarly, if you actually go to the Pasuk, uh, it talks about, it's basically, a pas- the, the, the Talmud it talks about the three oaths in relation to uh, Pasuk in Shir Hashirim and the Song of um, Solomon, Song of Songs. And it talks about us not going back to the land. And this is how the Rabbi Zera, um interprets the, the three, uh, the, the Pasuk, is that we shouldn't, there, there's basically it conveys three years. But when you read the language, it talks about the the O daughters of Jerusalem. I adjure you. This is the English translation. I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles and by the does or the hinds of the field, that you stir not up nor awake my love till it please. So the the rabbis of the Talmud then interpret, or some rabbis in the Talmud interpret that as being the the famous three oaths. And it's effectively saying, as as I understand it, and feel free to correct me, that um, the Jews should not go on mass to um, as a wall to to Israel, and they should not rebel against the nations unless the nations excessively oppress you. And the the the, the key there is the the gazelles and the does of the field. Um, and what it means by that is that the Jews will become like like prey. If they go back and create a state, they'll be like prey. They'll be like gazelles. They'll be like the, the, the does of the field. And they'll just be picked off by the nations. And this was obviously the rabbis who, uh, who are discussing this. Uh, this is the, the height of the Roman Empire. Israel has just been smashed. And so they're looking at the, 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 the horrors of what happens when you rise up against Rome. Like this is a mighty, mighty empire. And obviously someone rising up against Rome is going to be like a gazelle against the, the against a lion compared to this mighty empire. Yet if that Pasuk is talking halakha today, it's prophetically saying that if the Jews establish a state, well, that that's a very we can falsify that. So what's happening? Today, the Jews have never been stronger. Nobody looks at Israel and thinks, you poor little gazelle. Look how look how weak, look how, look how easily 
the, the, the you are going to be picked off. No, it's the opposite. The everybody sees Israel as a powerhouse. They see Israel as a lion, not as a gazelle. And so you then go even further when you look at the actual rabbi who's saying all this, the, who is putting forward the, the rabbi's era of the three oaths in Shir Hashirim Rabbah. He then changes his mind and says he was wrong and he actually goes to Israel himself. And so I think there's a reason why all the major rabbis left this out of their codifications of Jewish law because it isn't Jewish law. Um, it, it's a mashal. It is, it's there to, to, to teach Jews a lesson, but it's not there to deny Jews the right. And it's a very, very extraordinary claim. It's, when you make an extraordinary claim, you need extraordinary evidence. So if you are saying there is a prophetic law, there is a law. No, it's not a mashal. It's not there. It's not a metaphor. It's not there to, to, uh, to guide Jews. And to, but it's, this is a law from God that we shouldn't go back. That's a very strong claim because we have in black and white text throughout the Tanakh, the yes. eternal promise of the land of Israel to the Jewish people. The final thing, as for the temple descending from, from heaven, obviously, if I'm following Mishneh Torah, it details that the, the one of the signs of the Mashiach is he's going, the, the temple will be rebuilt. It's not going to come down from heaven. And it talks about he will gather the rest of the Jews because they're already Jews in the land of Israel. But And, and the, the temples whole... are always built uh, naturally. They were never built supernaturally. And, exactly. And, part of the and there's thing... an there's an entire Rambam literally tells us how to make that. There's an entire um, section of the Mishnah Torah which tells us how to build the temple. Right, it's going so, to be from heavens. Why? Why is he documenting well, the actual measurements of this area, and that area? It gives yeah, us I mean, I, I think also like there's this idea that you know we can't, we shouldn't fight our own battles without God fighting it for us. But when has that ever happened? I mean, even Yeshua, Yeshua's conquest was involving military strategy and setting going as spies and uh you know they they had to look at the terrain and they they didn't just march in there and just it was handed to them like it was it wasn't uh you know god just killing all of the inhabitants in their sleep you know it was it was fought you know it, that 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 so i think there's definitely a resentment uh that seculars uh you know had a hand in building the land of israel and i think that's actually a very um beautiful thing that even people who were not can not observant had a hand in it like it's kind of like this the idea the the idea of mashiach uh coming riding on a donkey you know the, maybe a process like that where it's a lowly from coming from a lowly place maybe that that the birth pangs of mashiach kind of started in that way um and i don't see a, an issue with that but to address the the point that they make about let's say um, a prophet having to confirm if this is legitimate or not, um, I would say, why would we need another prophet to confirm a prophecy that was already made, right? And it was already fulfilled, clearly. And I'll read it for you. It's in Sefer Devarim. It's in the Torah. You know, it says, Then Hashem, your God, will restore your fortunes and take you back in mercy, and God will bring you together again from all the nations to which you have been scattered. Even if your outcasts are at the ends of the world, from there your God Hashem will gather you, from there Hashem will fetch you, and your God Hashem will bring you to the land that your fathers possessed, and you shall possess it. And God will make you more prosperous and more numerous than your ancestors. So it happened. Whether I'm... we, it, the prophecy is there. We don't need El Yahanavi to come flying on a chariot to tell us that this is, has to happen. It already happened. And I think, it, 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 uh, imagine reading that. Imagine then praying every single day, three times, to return, to rebuild Jerusalem. And it gets done in your lifetime. You can witness it. You can see it with your eyes. And instead of falling on the floor and thanking Hashem, your response is to say that this is heresy. It's like, it's like we've been praying for this moment for 2,000 years. Part, part of the problem, I think, respectfully to them, because they were great chachamim, like you mentioned, but part of the problem is that they're, may, they follow their rabbis, uh, their dynastic leadership, which is kind of strange. It's antithetical to the tradition. But let's just accept that they have dynastic leaders. And they're, if someone said something 150 years ago or 100 years ago, 
and then they nobody came after to kind of supersede what what that rabbi said a lot of the Haredim will be stuck on that idea they, they'll have a hard time um you know the, evolving their views or kind of seeing you have the em habanim smecha and you have rav cook who are obviously very uh special um and they were able to see beyond that but it's sad and and, and the rabbi of my community rabbi, rabbi eliyahu ben chaim pointed out that you know it's sad that you see that a lot of the uh, a lot of I shouldn't say all, but a lot of the um, rabbis who opposed Zionism, at least the the first, you know, the Herzl's version of Zionism, they perished in the Shoah, and they didn't even allow their, you know, they didn't. Ha- they had opportunities to get people to leave, and and they didn't. And if they were alive today, the Emma Banim Smecha is a perfect example, realizing the the mistake um, that we. This is something very different, and. I don't think they would have known if they would have known the amount of Torah that is being learned in the land of Israel today and the religious Zionism and just I the um, it's I don't think it's unprecedented. They wouldn't have even believed the amount of Torah that was being learned today in Israel. Um, so I think they would have maybe changed their minds had they seen into the future. Uh, but I would also say I think it is changing. So I think reality, the reality of having a Jewish state of having political representation in that Jewish state, of that Jewish state surviving and being here in 10 years' time and 50 years' time and 100 years' time, that reality is going to be the greatest mechanism for creating change amongst those communities that are opposed for religious reasons against that state of existence. It already happens. I mean, I encounter Hasidim from all, from, from Satmar to Bobov to Belza who are either publicly or privately, depending on which community they belong to, in support of the the, the state's existence. Um, just because of the nature of what I do, it puts me into contact with people yeah. from... Same with me. They, um, they, they, they actually, I've actually interacted with a bunch of them who are like, publicly, they can't say how they really feel, but they really, they're like, it's so obvious, you know, that this is the the way. Um, I actually think that the, the most ironic thing is when you see like Haredim celebrating Hanukkah, because that Hanukkah is like basically exactly what we're, you know, this is modern day Israel. What's the difference? They fought. There is a group of people who, who uh, it was a military victory. It wasn't sanctioned by Hashem. You know, it was something that people got together to fight against our enemies and reconquer, you know, and reestablish uh, Yushalayim. And we celebrate. We have a holiday after it. And it's really, and it's not like they were great uh, religious, they didn't have a re- great religious impact on the Jewish nation. In fact, later on, we know that the Hashmonaim were not the greatest uh, people, but the fact is that we turn this into a holiday. And why is it changing now? So the more we talk about these issues, the more we bring these things to light, um, I find that there are a lot of Haredim who start to, you know, they reach out and they say, you know, you guys make great points. And they, they never really they're almost not allowed to hear about these things, that there's another side of the argument. Um, and we live in an amazing time where we have access to information. And unfortunately, a lot of the Kharim don't. So the more and more we advance technologically, the more people have, you know, information on their phones and they can actually listen to podca- listen to podcasts like this, they can become informed and they can change their views. And okay, completely. I think the the biggest. I think you hit the nail on the head. Then I think the biggest catalyst for change is actually going to be technology. I'm most. I don't know. I can't speak for Israel because I don't live in Israel, but I live in the UK. And most Haredim I know have access to the internet. Um, and you'd be surprised how many Wi-Fi signals you pick up when you drive through some of the most religious communities in the UK. Um. So I think that's the biggest. Is, is it, we were talking before about um, Rambam, um, Maimonidean, um, thought like the, it really flourishing um, today, and that's primarily down to the internet. The yeah. internet has been able to connect Jews to information that hasn't been available to them at all historically, and suddenly you can look at fragments from a Geniza, you can look at um, manuscripts from wherever, you can connect with other Jews who have ideas that you've never been in. And these kind of technological changes obviously hit other communities as well. And I think the Haredim are experiencing that as well. And so, yeah, yeah. I think- and, and, not, and not just that, technology 
is Israel, the modern day Israel is kind of like a, a greatest claim for fame because that's what's actually building all of our relationships with the Arab world because everyone wants this technology. Israel, Israel is now, you know, somebody that people want to make, you know, be partners with. And, you know, whether you see it's, it's from Hashem or whether it's, it's obviously it's from Hashem, but it's also from, uh, you know, the, the Jewish people. Um, so I think that it's, it's an amazing thing to witness. Um, it's a scary thing for a lot of people because they're like, you know, this is something unprecedented, but we, we really see that. I, I know maybe this is a controversial statement. I've said it on my podcast before, but Israel today in, in its 70 plus years is probably the most successful iteration of any version of Israel that existed before in terms of Torah study in terms of freedom, in terms of, um, you know, uh, allies in, in the world, and also like having leadership, like we had mostly corrupt leaders in the past, in, in the ancient Israel, uh, the, the Davidic monarchy was good, and, and as Shlomo as well, but then a lot of them were not that great. Menashe reigned for 55 years, was purely evil, idolatrous, and so on. And, you know, it wasn't, it was kind of a failed experiment in a way, for the most part. Um, and you know it was it divided after the time of of Shlomo, right? With his two with his two sons. So today you could say that in seventy years Israel has been the most prosperous. You know you can make the argument than it's ever been. I would frame it similar but slightly different. I would say that the last time that we had a state, we introduced monotheism in its current form to the world, and the values that our ancestors wrote down and codified have be been become the foundation that underpins the progression of Western society. So the and that was what we achieved the last time we had a state. We're 70 years into this state, and the impact we're having on the world and on the Jewish people is profound. And we're only 70 years in. We're right at the very beginning. Can you imagine the contribution we are going to make as we really accelerate and solidify the, this, the, 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 the state of Israel, the Zionist project? Yeah, and I think that the, the, you know, spreading of the Jews throughout the nations, um, we picked up a lot of the good and some of the bad as well from all the nations that were, you know, hosting us. And it was a terrible, terrible exile. But at the same time, like you said, that was the way, of, in a way, it was exporting this idea. Judy, whenever Jews got in contact with another nation, they they influenced them in, in positive ways. And uh, you see that, you know, now after, you know, introducing the world, that even Christians and Islam wouldn't exist without Judaism, Christianity and Islam. So you see all this happening. And then now all this knowledge that we got from around the world has been brought back to this tiny little piece of land smaller than the size of New Jersey. And we have this amazing breadth of knowledge and culture, uh, you know, that is just like a melting pot. It's kind of like a mini America in a way, because it's like a melting pot of all these different cultures and ideas of, of the Jews that we've brought back all of our experiences. Um, so I think that that is so miraculous um, in itself, besides the, you know, the military victories and all that, which are also miraculous. But this to me is the most miraculous thing. We have a people who are still speaking Hebrew. They're still learning the same Torah. They're still, you know, their culture is very much tied to their Jewish identity. This is a miracle. No other nation in, in history has ever been exiled more than once and maintained their identity. It's an, it's a fascinating thing. Even and to I, a skeptic who, and an atheist, you got to quite, you got to admit this is pretty remarkable. And I, I go even further. While the rest of the world is becoming more and more irreligious, Israel's going the other way. Israel is becoming more religiously conscious, more conscious of um, of the of the Creator, of of our rich, rich religious traditions. It's becoming more and more religious, while the rest of the world is in free fall that everything about israel is, is miraculous um but at least from, from my perspective so i want to end on one one thing because i took up way more time than uh we planned but That's i really wanted you you mentioned left-wing anti-semitism 
uh, before. And I feel like that's like the easy kind of like the Orthodox Jews always like to point to that. But you actually made a video recently about, you know, Ben Shapiro's statement when the whole Kanye West thing happened. Um, and you were saying that you, you were showing clips of different right wing anti-Semites, how like we need to wake up and stop like brushing off, especially in America. I find like if they're Orthodox Jews who are Trump supporters, they'll kind of brush off right wing anti-Semitism as like, eh, it's not a real thing. It's not it's not so it's it's kind of exaggerated. And you pointed out you shed light on on the fact that right wing anti-Semitism is very much um you know, going on right now, and it's extremely dangerous. So maybe you could end us off with, you know, a little bit of information about that. Oh, you're you're muted, I think. Definitely. But what I'd like to do before we do that is do a little quiz. Oh, so what I'd like you to <laughs> do, if you can, is tell me who said, where, where does this anti-Semitism come from? The far left, the far right, or is it Islamist? I'm, I'm going to read it out loud for those who are on um, listening to the audio. Our nation was tested by the cancerous lump that is the Jews. And then the options are far left, far right, or Islamist. So just because, you know, I know I kind of can guess that the answer is far right, I'll say far right. So let's see, does this, this should work. Oops, that's, oh. that's actually by Ahmad Baha, um, Sheikh Ahmad Baha of Hamas. So that is incorrect. So next, the next one. Okay. Hence today, I believe that I am acting in accordance with the will of the almighty creator by defending myself against the Jew. I am fighting for the work of God. Far left, far right, or Islamist? Uh, I'm going to say far right. Yeah, absolutely yeah, right. All right. Adolf Hitler, Mein Kampf. Okay, next. What is the worldly religion of the Jew? Huckstering. Uh, I can't see the word because it's being covered. What, what is his? Uh, what is his worldly god? Money. Uh huh. What, so is, what is the worldly religion of the Jew? Huckstering. Um, what I is his? Say the far god? left. Bang on. That was Karl Marx in All his right. paper on the Jewish question. <laughs> right. Um, well, we're, not of, of, we're not proud of that Jew. Yeah. <laughs> I think this is the final one. This race that poisons everything by sticking its nose into everything without ever mixing with any other people demand its expulsion from France with the exception of those individuals married to French women, abolish synagogues and not admit them to any employment, demand its expulsion. Finally, pursue the abolition of this religion. It's not without cause that the Christians call them deicides. The Jew is the enemy of humankind. They must be sent back to Asia or be exterminated. Pretty hardcore. That is, I would say, far left. Yeah, that is um, Pierre Joseph. Yeah, because the French thing gave it away, but for, uh, Pierre Joseph. Okay. Yeah, he was a contemporary. He got his wish. He got his wish. We went back to Israel. So he was a contemporary of Karl Marx. He was writing that the Jews must, uh, they, they were, um, we should be expelled from France, um, that we're poisoning everything by sticking our nose into everything. He was saying this 100 years before the Holocaust. And he's one of the, the leaders of left-wing anarchist thought. He's saying he was one of the, the forefathers, one of the avot. Um, and the reason I brought these quotes up is... Far left, far right, Islamist, black Hebrew Israelite. It really doesn't matter where the anti-Semitism is coming from. They draw on the same tropes. They draw on the same hatred. And it's almost impossible to tell them apart. The only reason you can tell them apart is you're looking at who is, is uttering the, the sentiment. And so there is a misconception amongst Jews that... So if you speak to a left-wing Jew, they will tell you that the, the only threat that we face is far right. White supremacy is our greatest threat. And in America, that's a very real statement. In America, there is a very real threat of far white, far right, white supremacist um, anti-Semitism. The far right in Europe had traditionally been focused for the last 20 years, 10, well, let's say 10 to 20 years, have been focused very much on 
um, opposing Islam, and they'd kind of forgotten about those. You could even go to far right marches and see far right protesters waving Israeli flags and rainbow flags and any flag that they thought was would upset the Muslims that they are opposed to. Mm-hmm. What we're seeing now is that's changing. So mm-hmm. while white supremacy has always been a very real problem in America, it has been a declining problem, outside, certainly in Europe and certainly in the UK. But what we're now seeing is voices on the right that have traditionally been even pro-Israel and pro-Jewish are now coming out. So there's a very famous person called, um, I won't say his name, but it rem- it rhymes with um, Gommy Bobinson. Um, and I can't say his name because you'll get the platform from YouTube if I say his name. Um, but he's one of the, he's a very, very famous person on the right in the UK. And he's always been seen as pro-Israel and pro-Jewish. He came out with a video congratulating Kanye for speaking out against Jewish power. And so why do people get the impression that he I don't know that much about him, but why do people get the impression that he was pro-Israel? Because he was on the No, I mean, because he the he has traditionally been very openly supportive of the state of Israel. He's visited it several times, he's posed with like standing on a tank and things like that. Like he's always marketed himself. I've seen as... him with I've seen him with that uh, guy Avi Yemeni. Yeah, yeah. So and, and Avi Yemeni is actually Jewish um, and yeah, yeah. Uh, in Israel. Um, but yeah, I mean, Tommy Robinson. I, I don't want to say too much, but he's definitely associated with Jews. He's promoted Israel. He's I. But and I just don't want to associate him with people who maybe wouldn't want to be associated with him. But he has certainly come out numerous times with very positive messages. Mm-hmm. And so why would somebody who's traditionally marketed themselves as pro-Jewish suddenly come out and praise Kanye? Well, it's very simple. The right is moving and it's mutating, or let's say even regressing um, back to where it was and its primal focus is now Jews. It is switching from all the other places. So there have been times where the the, the black community has been its focus. In the UK, the, the Muslim community has been its focus. Now it's very much the Jews. Well, it's, it's an easy time to, when everyone's piling on, you you get, you, you know. If, I if think it's, it's more than that. I think it's whenever you enter an economic downturn, exactly. downturn Jews have a very easy scapegoat. Yes. And so... We are the very unfortunate um, whenever there are these downturns, you see the right becoming emboldened, you see its focus um, switching to us. And so I think that's why we're seeing the rise in right wing. Why, why is that? Why is the uh, I mean, I, I know the answer, but I want to hear from you. Why is it that, you know, Jews are associated with, whenever there's a financial collapse or whatever it is? Why? Why is it that the Jews throughout history have always been kind of blamed um obviously you, you you can trace it back to um in Christian lands where we uh had to be involved in usury because we weren't allowed to be involved in other um in other industries and we actually became extremely good with money because of that um but then it's always held against us but what what do you think is you know the root of that so um, I'm just going to repeat what you say but effectively Jews were always, in Christian lands and in Muslim lands, used as the the layer between the masses and the 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 state or the the khilafah, the the caliphate or the the monarchy. the monarchy, and they would collect the taxes. They would be the easy scapegoat, and they were always scapegoated. And so that there's there's centuries of financially rooted anti-semitism um and actually it goes back even further it's really fascinating if you even read the the tropes that we hear about jews go right the way back to roman times but we, we won't go over for, for, for brevity we'll we'll focus on the the modern period um the the jews 
because we've been in that situation where we've not been able to work in other professions, we've not been able to own property, own land, join guilds, etc. We were forced to take on these roles like tax collectors or financiers, and um, because it was one of the the, the few um, industries available to us, and as a consequence, the stereotypes evolved and have been inherited from generation to generation. And so today, it's very, and I, I literally documented it. It was really fascinating to do to, to, and scary to do. But during, as an example, during the the, the COVID period, um, like when there were the lockdowns and the like, what was very interesting was to watch far right actors. So we monitor their telegram. So we see what they're doing, how they're recruiting. We've infiltrated many of their organizations. And what they do, they actively prey on these communities where you can switch somebody from focusing. So most people in the conspiracy theory world um, will believe in elites or globalists. There's, there's certain actors. Illuminati, yeah, lizard people, all that crazy stuff. Yeah, and they're, they're, maybe they're not anti-Semitic. Maybe they don't think it's Jews, but it's very easy for someone to then come in and switch that to Jews. Right. Similarly, when it comes to the economic downturn, it's very easy for bad actors to come in and take that genuine outrage, uh, like the state of the economy, and to switch that from, say, governments or corporations and switch that to Jews. And that tends to be, in my experience, what's happening here is the right will um, divert the focus from where it should be rightfully directed and then directed over to the Jewish community. Well, here's the thing. Jews are always disproportionately represented in positions of power and in for example 20 percent of nobel prize winners are jews even though we make up less than one percent of the world's population um most industries you'll see jews at the top and i attribute that to you know we have our culture values education um literacy um and working very hard you know that's part of our culture and what happens is is that when you'll see jews who are on you know, Trump's cabinet, and then you'll see him, uh, Jew, Jews on Biden's cabinet. And then the haters will say, oh, look at those Jews involved. But And they'll say every single president, you know, in history has had Jews on his cabinet. And that's, you could blame them. But the 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 response should be every single president has been a Christian. So are we to say that all bad presidents were caused because they, they were, they did what they did because of Christianity? No, it's absurd. But it's just an easy way to point the finger at, at, at our people. And you know, I think it's it's very sad, but I wanted to actually touch on the Kanye thing before we go, because Kanye and Nick Fuentes, people were like shocked. You see a guy who and that's actually a way to galvanize people against the Jews, because you're like, wow, extreme opposites are coming together to to fight against the Jews. You see Kanye, who's who's, you know, kind of promoting like a like a black supremacy in a way. And you see um, white supremacy with Nick Fuentes, why they're working together and people don't really get it. It's because they want the same thing. They both want segregation. Of, of the races so i would I, I would actually i don't know if i'd call there are definitely black supremacists and there are a lot of them i don't know if i would put kanye in that camp i think kanye is just more of an anti-semite there are definitely black supremacists that support kanye and we're definitely seeing actual black supremacists now working with white supremacists yeah, that's what i'm referring to i'm referring to them working yeah. together not not necessarily yeah. kanye himself yeah but I, but that said i think it's it's not new. So um, Rockwell, uh, there was a uh, one of the original American Nazis worked with the Nation of Islam. It's we have this incredible ability to unite people that hate each other. So if you look at Shia and Sunni, they've been killing each other for centuries. Yet they will put down their arms and work together to kill Jews. So there you have Hezbollah and Hamas. So, like these are organizations that should have no relationship with each other. Iran literally bankrolls Islamic Jihad, bankrolls Hamas, but these are these are factions of Islam that should not work together. Similarly, you have black supremacists and white supremacists, and I've got so much for we've we've um, collected so much footage of these organized uh, these, these movements were individuals within these movements putting aside their hatred of each other 
Like the white supremacists in America literally strung up black people. They they butchered them and murdered them in the most abhorrent ways. And the inheritors of this vile like hatred are now putting aside that hatred to work with the very people they've been opposed to to kill Jews or to to demonize Jews or to persecute and oppress Jews. It's incredibly scary. It is, it is. And, you know, Kanye said something about his jealousy of Jews who, you know, kind of, they're, they're great at reading contracts, you know? And then he said, our people should be, you know, he was talking about his community, we should learn from this, you know, all these little bits of truth were coming out. But in reality, I was kind of concerned. I was like, okay, now what's going to happen is the Jewish reaction, we're going to cry wolf, and we're going to say anti-Semitism, anti-Semitism, and then he's going to lose all of his sponsors, and he's going to lose all of his, it's kind of like a double-edged sword. Um, but if you look at it now, you see like, okay, Adidas is not owned by Jews. Um, you know, uh, Balenciaga is not owned by Jews. Chase or whatever, who else was working with him is not owned by Jews. So so really, he shot himself in the foot, and he tried to use the Jews as a scapegoat, but those Jews who were kind of, quote-unquote, screwing him out of his contracts, you know, he was getting screwed into a $4 billion or $2 billion uh, net worth at the time. That, now, that's my thing. So Kanye West is the richest, or was, the richest artist there's ever been. Forget black artist, richest artist. He was worth billions. And he was complaining that he's been exploited by... I wish some Jews would exploit me. Like, that's I I the greatest culture that has ever been. Like, I would... I would, Please, if there's any... If any of these powerful Jews are watching the podcast, please, please, please exploit me. I want to be exploited to the tune of 4 billion. That would, that would really help. Yeah, yeah. So it's just really... It's crazy to see this happening in, in our lifetime. I, I never thought I'd see it growing up. But uh, I'm very hopeful. I'm an optimistic person. And I think people like you, you know, we, we need to get your voice out even more. And uh, I really appreciate you coming on the podcast. And hopefully, you know, we can do this again one day. Definitely. I've really enjoyed it. Really appreciate what you do. The, the people you host on, on this podcast, as I said, many of them are my teachers, people I look up to and admire. It's a tremendous service that you're doing. Um, and you deserve many, 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 many more subscribers than you have. Um, and I'll certainly be um, promoting the, the the podcast to my audience. So thank you so much for hosting me. Um, I'm definitely not worthy of being said <laughs> said in the same the same I'm sentence as many of the guests uh, the guests you've had on this show. So thank you. Thank you. Take care.